Oh. And, and, yeah, and I'm doing a test too, by the way, and, and my audio for uh, this evening. I don't know, uh, we're having a little audio challenge uh, tonight. And um, But uh, just want to mention again, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time tonight. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've got uh, an offer. Uh, you know, the, uh, the it's going to go with the program tonight, uh, Starfire Chronicles. And, uh, and go to the Urgent tab, okay? You can download the most powerful translation of the Gospel of Thomas in history and go read it and tell me it's not a fact. The sample is there. And we got, we got the document uh, blossoming right now. And I got a dictionary on the occult nature of words, the occult nature of legal terms, and the original thought in diction taking you back into ancient time, okay? So go look at the offer on the Urgent tab. We need your support. We're hitting the wall. At the end of the month, we need uh, uh, $450 for rent plus uh, to pay our other bills, okay? So uh, we want to be here, but uh, you're all here. And so just a little bit, if all of you did a little bit, you know, 5 or $10 that you do that, it, 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 we would be fixed right now if every one of you participated. So thank you for all of those who did participate. Sim in Georgia sent a, generation, a generous donation today and, and several others. And by the way, I need also uh, Beth in uh, Galveston, Texas, to please give me a call. Uh, okay, right, regarding your order, please give me a call. Our number is on the archive page. Just go call me tomorrow or at your convenience. Okay, best if you're listening in. And uh, sorry for that, Christian, uh, but uh, we're good to go. And uh, how are you doing tonight? Oh, not too bad. Uh, pretty good. Uh, I've been talking a lot this week, so we'll see how long I bet you time. have. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting lots of feedback um, from your programming, all positive. They're you know, very grateful to uh, to you and, and and even the network for having you on here. And of course, um, uh, we you know we've had you on for over a year now, and uh, very honored to uh, uh, to be working with you. So uh, uh, it's all yours, and uh, tell it like it is, Kristen. Yeah, we're closing in on two years almost here. So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Saturday, January 9th show of Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. I'm your host, Christian Walters. So. We're no longer in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, so buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. We're in Oz. We've been talking about trust, which is one of the main words in the title of the show, Money, Banking, and Trust, by Moving Titles and Commerce. And we've really been getting into the trust here recently, last two months, especially last six over the last six months. And we've been going through the book called Gilbert's Law Summaries, and it's a, a series of summaries, and the one you want to get is Trust. And it's by Edward C. Halbach, Jr. And I would get the book, order the book, Gilbert's Law Summaries, Trust, Edward C. Halbach, Jr. And make sure that you get the, uh, I guess, it's, uh, one I've got is copyrighted 2008, but I guess when you go on the ISBN number, it says that that number is really, I guess, a 2007 possibly or something. But anyway, get the latest version, 2008, as close as you can. Don't get one some of those earlier ones. Make sure it's not in the 90s. Some of the versions, I guess, they have a surplus of some older ones, and they'll send you those instead. Make sure you get a 2008. And the ISBN number on that is 13978-2008. One eight one one two one. Again, that number is ISBN one three nine seven eight zero three one four one eight one one two one. So I would suggest that everybody gets the book itself because there is a download, and what the problem with that download was, I believe, is that it was an older version, and it does not follow along as I read it, and it's going to be different, and it quite possibly not might not have been copied right. So, so we've been talking through trust here on the show, but I would like to ask those of you that are just going to listen to the show tonight, if you don't intend to ask questions, if you have the ability to jump off the call and get on the Internet, you can access this show and listen to it at therealpublicradio.net. If you would free up the call lines for some other people, because I'm getting some uh, answers back that they have trouble getting on the show because there's not enough line capacity. Well, oh, oh. Kristen, 
Christian, I got to jump in. We've got at least a minimum of 250, if not 500, capacity. So we're not even close there. Um, you know, just just so you're aware, it's not the it's not the conference line. Uh, it's people's telephones. This this just happens. We don't know why. Most often, you know, the the, the problem phones are cell phones, uh, uh, definitely. But uh, uh, you know, so we got a 250 minimum, if not 500 capacity. We can boost it anytime we need to. Uh, but we're not even we're not even uh, halfway there yet. Uh, but no matter what, if you get off uh, on the stream, you can listen for free if it's costing you, you know. And uh, but uh, we're, uh, we're we're definitely not overcrowded, you know. So I just want to clarify that. Okay, so it might not be that we're not overcrowded, but then somehow they're having trouble getting on. So the way to access it would be to jump on the internet at three d real public radio dot net and listen to it there. That way you won't have any problems. Yeah. So with that out of the way, also I'd like to announce that I have a new email address. It's similar to the first one. It's titled Moving Titles. But instead of it being Hushmail as the old one was, it is now Hotmail.com. So it's Moving Titles at Hotmail.com. It's a lot bigger box, and I should be able to take some more emails there than what, uh, and it won't uh, jam up so so bad. So. Again, that e new email address is movingtitles at hotmail.com. So I would like to ask people out there tonight that uh, we need to be getting better organized. Uh, we need to ask those people that are out there whether they are asking their friends and their neighbors and spreading the truth out there, and especially if you know people who are like-minded with us already, you need to invite them in onto this call. Get them in, in here and get them exposed to this this uh, trust realm of it. Uh, contact as many people as you can. Invite them on the show. And before the show, make sure that you remind them to, to get onto the call or listen in on the Internet. Get, get each one of you. If you could get, say, your 12 people. And everybody had 12 people under them in a little group. And get your little group together and contact them. Stay in contact with them. Check back with them after the show. Do some reviews. Put a little study to group together. So get, get some groups formed on your end and pull them on into the call. I'd also like to announce a program that I'm coming out with. I'll probably call it Trust Ambassadors. I'm looking for people who we'll call trust ambassadors that are looking for become teachers in this. And that they're not just in this for their own solution, for their own problem. They're in it for the long haul, in other words. I need some people that are willing to be taught, that can be mentored in a, my 12 group, so to speak. And then those 12 will go out and get their 12, and everybody will have a 12 un under them, say. And if we do that in a couple layers, we'll have a lot of people. But I'm looking for 12 people that are in this for the long haul, and preferably you have some kind of knowledge already under this, and you want to take this trust in a whole lot farther. And those 12 will be closely tied with me, and I'm going to call them trust ambassadors. And those trust ambassadors will have people under them taking care of those people, because, you know, the, the biblical thing was that Moses, he got so he got so depressed because he had so many people coming to him with all these their problems and solving our problems. He had three million plus people, all with these problems coming to him. He couldn't handle it all. He was telling them, "Lord, I wish you'd smite them all because I can't handle it." So then he got the idea from a friend there that he was to divide the groups up into hundreds and appoint someone over the hundreds, and then all those that were appointed over them, he would counsel them. They took the pressure off of him. And you got to keep in mind that I understand everybody probably in this that has some kind of problem, you know. And I, I read the emails. My email box is swamped. You wouldn't believe. I, I, all the sad stories and things and all that everybody's going on, I, I know that. But you, what you have to realize is, you know, some of you have given me heck for saying, you know, why don't you just at least answer me yes or no. But, you know, I don't even have time for that. Because if I was to answer everybody with a yes or no, I wouldn't get anything done in the day. So you're going to have to bear with me and, and accept my apologies for not getting back with you because, you know, I can't. There's no way I can. I can't answer everyone's in individual email with even a yes or a no. 
So if you do not hear back from me, whatever the reason, it's really because there's too many of you out there with a problem, and I can't help every one of you. And I would be like Moses trying to solve 3 million people's problems. I can't do it. So I need to form groups under me. I need to form my 12 because I can stay in close communication with 12 people, and then those 12 will have to communicate through their 12. And that's how we're going to have to organize this because I can't give personal attention to everyone. It isn't going to work out. I'm working for the mass as a whole. If I give too much individual attention to specific people, I don't have any time left for anything else, let alone personal life. So accept my apologies out there, you know, and bear with me. We're on a project together. So if you think you're qualified for a trust ambassador, you want to be one, you know, send me an email at the hush mail, or excuse me, the hotmail, the new address. Moving titles at hot, hotmail.com. So that's a new email. So now, we've been talking about trust. For those of you who have the book, again, I'm going to go through page 131. That's where the spendthrift trust is, and that's what I liken it to, a.k.a. also known as the Declaration of Independence. That's where the unalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence are. It's really a spendthrift trust, and that's section 460 on page 131, where it's under the section under restraints on alienation, the spendthrift trust and related trust. So it's restraints on alienation or alienation, whatever you want to pronounce it. Well, in other words, it's a restraint on liens. And liens are nothing more than when they lien you up, they transfer your property. But it's, about, it's all about transferring property. And the Declaration of Independence says you have un- unalienable rights. So you have non-transferable rights, period. If they're non-transferable, they're non-transferable in any situation. Period. That's it. So this section says the spendthrift trust is one in which, by statute... So remember this Gilbert's Law, it's all about statutory trust, and it's all about the black side of the public, really. So if I teach you what the black is, when you see white, the other side, the private trust, you'll recognize it by sight. If I teach you what the black is, the statutory trust, you'll recognize the white by sight. The dispensary trust is one in which, by statute, or more often by virtue of the terms of the trust, in other words, the Declaration of Independence, the beneficiary is unable voluntarily or involuntarily to transfer his interest in the trust. In other words, he cannot sell or give away his right to future income or capital. And his creditors, now creditors come under a debtor-creditor relationship. So that's what commerce is today, debtor-creditor relationship. And it's run by UCC, GAP, and FASB. So his creditors are unable to collect or attach, that would be put a lien, against such rights. This type of trust, Declaration of Independence, is usually created to provide an interest for the beneficiary that will secure, will be secure against his own improvidence. In other words, his own wrongdoings. So if he did something wrong, the founding fathers of the Declaration of Independence said, hey, you have unalienable rights and they can't be taken from you without due process of law. So that would be an estoppel and a res judicata. And you might want to see Section 475 in the book for that. But this is the big bingo. This was the starting point where I was reading that, and I said, man, that's nothing more than a Declaration of Independence. So that's what was the recognition of it. Then I referenced the C the W eight Ben part three, the notional principal contracts on line 11. So the example of that would be settler to trustee and trust for beneficiary to be paid to beneficiary personally and to no other, no other, whether claiming by beneficiary authority or otherwise, unquote, creates a spendthrift trust. So now we want to jump to, that happened in 1776. 
Now what we want to do is we want to jump to, say, 1871, or 1861, excuse me, Civil War. Civil War was all about paying the debt. And on page 139 now, Protective Trust, Section 498. Now, note this as being 1861 Civil War. A protective trust has long been used in England and increasingly used in American jurisdictions. A protective trust usually is an ordinary trust that pays out its income regularly, but which upon an attempted voluntary or involuntary alienation of the beneficiary's interest becomes a discretionary trust. So the debtors from the war, the beneficiaries, the creditors were wanting paid and they were trying to get an attachment, a lien against the beneficiary's property. So a trust was formed, a discretionary trust from this protection, protective trust in 1861. So this discretionary trust is also on the previous page, 138, section 490 now. Now this is your 1933 house chart resolution time. So a discretionary trust, you know, we thought that, that we're taking and they, uh, we volunteered the gold because there was a crisis. Well, the crisis was they had to collect all the assets from the beneficiaries because the creditors were seeking to lien the assets. And they put it into a discretionary trust, which was the continuation and re renaming of the dispenser of trust and the protective trust. And they turned it into this discretionary trust in 1933. So a discretionary trust is one in which the trustee, that would be the U.S. bankruptcy trustee, is given discretion to make or apply or withhold, withhold distributions of income or principal or both two or four, one or more of the beneficiaries, that'd be one or more that we the people, whether or not the instrument provides standards for the trustee's guidance. So they don't really interpret the Declaration of Independence being an instrument that provides the standards for the trustee's guidance under the modern view, more modern view. So they're saying that these standards aren't specifically spelled out, and I don't know how you could spell out even more than all our rights are unalienable, period. But anyway, that's what they're doing because nobody really knew what was going on, and they didn't specify anything or, or rebut it or complain the right way. Because they really didn't understand a trust was being formed. That's what happened, a trust. It was an invisible trust that was formed. So where the, now the trustee on the trust can withhold per his discretion because if he released the funds to the beneficiary, the creditor is going to jump all over the assets and defeat the purpose of the trust. So he's going to, with his discretion, withhold. So that explains why none of us have a consistent remedy in anything we do today. That's the big bingo. It's per the discretion of the trustee. For the fact that we had assets, but... By definition of Black's Law, see insolvency, where it says that even though you have assets, you just stop paying your debts. And upon stop paying your debts, you become insolvent or bankrupt. So when we stopped paying our debts, we were technically bankrupt, the war debt. We stopped paying the debt. When we did that, that we were bankrupt automatically. But to protect uh, all the assets, they put all the assets in trust until the time when the beneficiaries can get solvent. Now, I jump ahead again on page 140, back to this protective trust, under the section 498, where it says the rationale. The rationale is a protective trust now. A protective tr trust may be intended to reach a result somewhat comparable to, and in fact more secure, then the result of a spendthrift trust, remember your spendthrift trust, your declaration of independence, but is logically less objectionable, less objectionable. You know, that's really less objectionable because it's really under the modern public view today. But it's 
really, it's not the will of the grantor who formed the original trust in 1776 who made gifts or grants of an unalienable right. But let's, let's argue that point later. So it's less objectionable under modern view, uh, public view, in that the beneficiary can be sure of receiving substantial trust benefits only as long as he keeps his debt paid. So as long as the beneficiary keeps himself solvent, pays his debts, he is going to have access to the trust. He'll have access to a remedy. But again, it's only if you first express it to be a trust. And nobody's expressed that Declaration of Independence to be a trust other than the signers on the Declaration of Independence. So we've identified the, the problem and the, the effects of the problem. Now we can come in with a solution. And the solution really is pay the past war debt, our fair share, or as a group, the whole thing. Pay the past war debt, the fair share, each of our share, fair share, and keep your present debts, pay that also, and keep yourself out of future debts. And when you do that, you'll have access to the trust fund because there's no need for the purpose of the trust to be there. If the purpose of the trust is fulfilled, then the trust terminates. And if you pay your fair share of the trust debt with your current debt that you owe, and don't get into debt any longer from that, then for you individually, the Republic will come back for you. Or we could pay it as a group. And as we pay it as a group, the Republic will come back for all of us. Now, that's even a super bingo on top of the bingo bingos right here. So all those people out there who want to get the Republic back, this is the solution to get the Republic back. The re today, the Republic and the common law are locked up in a trust. Let me repeat that. The Republic today and the common law are locked up in trust and not accessible because that's one of your rights. Rights is trust property held in trust. And the beneficiaries cannot have access to it until they pay the previous war debt, their fair share, and their present debt. And don't get into debt any longer. And for you individually, you will have the Republic back, and I will be able to make private credit payments with my private credit because now it won't be in a trust per the discretion of the trustee. And now I want to jump back again over to discretionary trust. We're doing some shuffling back and forth here, again on page 138. Section 490, which says, I'll read that definition again. The discretionary trust is one in which the trustee, U.S. trustee, bankruptcy trustee, is given discretion to make or apply or withhold distributions of income or principal or both to or for one or more beneficiaries. And here's the point. Whether or not the instrument provides standards for the trustee's guidance. I'm going to focus in on the word standards. So the instrument, which would be the Declaration of Independence, provides standards for the trustee's guidance. So in other words, think about, look at what they say here. It doesn't make any difference to them. It says whether they provide standards for the trustee's guidance. But if we go by the definition of trust, really a trust Relationship, by definition, under relationship, is an association between one person's reliance on the other person's specialized training, also termed fiducial relationship. Fiducial relationship, not fiduciary, fiducial relationship. That's a trust relationship. That's the definition of a trust relationship. An association based on one person's reliance on the other person's specialized training. That is a trust relationship. So we're talking about relationships all along in this Gilbert's Law Summaries. 
It's all about relationships. It's, a, it's learning how to identify the relationships that you're entering into on a moment-by-moment daily basis, especially when you're giving your signature. Especially when you're giving your signature. You must identify the relationship that you are forming right there, whether it's a trust, a fiduciary, an agency, or debtor-creditor, or others. You must focus and identify what type of relationship they're talking about. So now, we're going to jump to Black's Law 8th edition. We're going to look under prescription. And that's P-R-E-S-C-R-I-P-T-I-O-N. And prescription. Number one is the act of establishing authoritative rules. And two, a rule so established. Prescript. And here's the big one. Number three, the effect of the lapse of time in creating and destroying rights. Destroying rights through lapse of time. Is it by prescription? The effect of the lapse of time in creating and destroying rights. So if you don't express the trust within a certain amount of time, your rights will be destroyed. In other words, they will be locked up in trust. And that is the standard, whether or not the instrument provides standards for the trustee's guidance. The standard is by prescription. The act of establishing authoritative rules and the effect of a lapse of time in creating and destroying the rights. So it doesn't totally destroy the rights in the sense that, oh, you, know, you don't have them anymore because they can't take and destroy the rights. That would be totally absurd against the Constitution, or the you know, Constitution Declaration of Independence. I mean, so what they did is they just hid them from you, locked them up into trust, locked them from public, and locked their common law rights up, locked them up, and held them in trust, because you never came in with the right amount of time in expressing it to be a trust and understanding how to operate the trust, and through that lapse of time, that prescription. Destroyed the rights. Locked them up into trust. And it's per the discretion of the trustee. And really all those assets are sitting there waiting for you and all the interest that was generated off of the principal and still being held in trust today. It's all there waiting. And I just wonder how much it really is. Probably a phenomenal amount. More than enough to pay the original war debt and your present debts and take care of all your future debts. We are sitting pretty in this country, except on the public side, we're bankrupt, but on the private side, where it's all held in private trust, we are wealthier beyond belief. And we better start waking up to that fact, because they're going to carve this nation up very shortly. They're going to take and get at all those assets. Those people are getting into the DTC. I hate to disappoint you and burst your bubbles, but here it is. You're being asked questions. And the king does not ask questions, or the king does not answer questions. The king asks questions. So are you acting as king, asking the questions? Are you the king asking the questions, or are they asking the questions. I don't have to get into the DTC. I'm already in the DTC. My trusted certificate is in there, and so is yours, except you're not expressing it as a trust. You're expressing it as debtor creditor, and you're going to get a little bone they're going to give you, which you will be satisfied with, because they'll give you something probably to make it look good. Maybe you'll get three and a half billion dollars, or maybe at the most, maybe you might get thirty-five billion or so around the top. And you're going to say, "Okay, I'm going to be satisfied with that because, man, that's a phenomenal amount of money for me, right?" But how much more could you have had? You could have had the republic, along with all the assets since the formation, on the interest that was generated against the principal. 
and they're gonna they're gonna you, they're gonna sell you a bill of goods, and they're gonna take the whole pot. They're gonna give you one little bit, but don't be like the 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 three people that Jesus gave the key the uh, coins to, and don't be like the one sticking the coins into the ground that was cast out of the outer darkness because he didn't do anything with the knowledge, with the assets. We need to start organizing. Getting into groups. Some of you need to make a sacrifice to become trusted pastors and teachers. Otherwise, we have very short time. It may be too late already, but at least it only takes, like what, uh, who was it? Jefferson said, it only takes for a few good men to do nothing for tyranny to abound. Somebody, a few of us, need to start stepping forward and sticking up for one another with trust law. Because trusts are all around us. We just need to learn how to recognize them, the relationships that are being conducted right before our very noses. This whole book, Bob Gilbert's, is not about theory. It's about taking the, the way a trust is operating so that you can learn it and identify the trusts that are running your life. And really, you're the one forming them. You're, there, you're forming them by your signature. And you must, you must pay attention to the relationship you're forming with your signatures. If it's not a debt or creditor, or let's say it's not a trust, if it's debt or creditor, or whatever it is, relationship it is, you've got to realize that you can turn it into a trust. Because everything really has to be a trust. We don't have any lawful money today. Uh, just about every patriot will agree with that. We want constitutional money back. Well, the only way you're going to get, because it's held up a trust, is to come in and express the trust. The trust has to be there because you can't complete a contract. So that all contracts today became culpable contracts because you can't give value in exchange for consideration today because there's no lawful money. So a trust had to come in and fill that void. And every purchase that you think you're making, you're making a trust deposit and you didn't know it. And you have to know how to identify it through the elements, intent, purpose, party, specific trust res. And you have to have one of the four methods of formation, whether that's by declaration or transfer, or whether it be appointment or contract, or maybe one of the sub-definitions under transfer, which is A, endorsement, delivery, in bearer form, and C, assignment, on UCC3, and D, operation of law. We have to get our heads screwed on until we're recognizing the model that forms and operates a trust so that we can use that model to compare it to what we're doing. And then we have to learn how to create the evidence that will prove a trust, because once we claim the trust, we must prove the trust. And once we've proven the trust, that there is a trust, and who the parties are on the trust, that we're, say, grantor, uh, beneficiary on the private side, and they want to see us to be grantors, uh, trustee on the public side, like just quite might want to agree with them under a specific situation. But then I might want to maybe change that later on, as I've talked before on some of the other programs, to where both sides match the entities on both sides. On the public side, we might want to be grantor beneficiary for the long run to match the private side grantor beneficiary that we already are. And then when there's no conflict, the walls between the two dimensions come collapsing down because now the trust... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, looks like Christian uh, went back to Alpha Centauri, so hopefully he'll be back on in a second here. We'll be looking for him in the meantime. just want to tell you that uh, you are tuned into the right place at the right time. Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. Right here. Well, you were only gone for about a, you know, a minute, so let's say two minutes. Uh, just back up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, talk about the Republic and the common law coming back because it's held uh, in trust, it's locked up in trust, and if we really want to get the Republic to come back, then we need to pay the original war debt and our, our debts that are present so that the two sides of the ledger sheet, the, the public and the private, the separation between the two sides will dissolve because there's no more purpose for the trust to separate the two divisions. And the, the titles have been merged into one. The trust terminates. The purpose of the trust has been fulfilled. And now the rights, titles, and interests are back in the rightful owner, owners, which are we the people. The trust. Another definition of a trust is really out of Black's Law, it says trust is really, uh, well, down to its right title and interest, which is really a trust. Right title and interest is talking about a trust. It says a trust is a certain kind of right that the beneficiary has against the trustee and a certain kind of interest that the beneficiary has against the trustee. And this is right out of Black's Law. And a certain kind of interest that the beneficiary has in the trust property. That's a direct quote right out of Black's Law, 8th edition. Now, remember, property is title. So really, we're talking about right, title, and interest. We're talking about a trust. So anytime we're talking about right, title, and interest, we're talking about multiple trusts. A trust or a multiple trust. It's all about trust, and we need to look, recognize it as being trust. Why don't we open it up for some questions? Maybe before we really get going, maybe we will take a break. But uh, why don't we go to break, and then after break, we'll come back for some Q&A. But uh, in closing, after before the break, then in a, in a trust, you are a lender of an asset held in special deposit. But, but if you don't express the trust, then you're the debtor under UCC debtor-creditor relationship or law. So let's, let's take a short break, and then we come back, and we'll open up for some Q&A then. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Desert. You're welcome. So uh, what do we have to do? Press star 5 to uh, raise your hand? That's uh, correct. Star question? 5. Mm -hmm. And all the scope them out there. Everybody, get in line if you want to talk to Christian Walters. You always, we never had, hadn't had enough time in the last few weeks because of our own technical challenges here, and... Uh, Huh. I hadn't been I'm not eating right either, you know, so I hadn't been feeling too well these uh, past few weeks. Under a lot of stress, I'm not able to get my exercise because we're just I'm cramming his dictionary, uh, you know, like uh, 19 hours a day uh, with the uh, translations. So that, that work is important, and it's for the benefit of everyone. Now, hit star five if you have a question for Christian Walters. Okay, there we go. Danny in Texas, you're on. Good to have you. Yeah, good to be here. Uh, thank you, Christian. I was going through the uh, W8BN and uh, IMY, and I noticed all through there I took a, a blue highlighter and a pink one, and I started marking all the places where it said use period S period with pink, and then I marked it where it said United States spelled out with blue. Uh, give us a comment on that. What what? Why is there there's got to be a distinction there, I know. But what's your take on that? I'd have to look what you're that talking about there, because, let's see, can you give me an example of where it's at? I'll look at it, because i got the 8 bed right in front of me. Well, it's all through there. Okay. Uh, it, it may be, you know, sometimes it's even in the same sentence. It'll, it'll well, refer to period S period, and then it'll have United States spelled out. My take on it, without really studying it in more, would be, you know, they're, they're spelling out that there's both sides to the realm right there. I can design the code with the black and the white in it, with the two sides there. It's just that whichever way you've been brainwashed is the way you're going to interpret it. We've been brainwashed so long that we can't, we don't recognize the private from the, from the public. Yeah, I think they're definitely 
uh, telling us right there, you know, once we learn what they're saying. Well, I think the keys with the Ben forms is to not really use their actual form because it's designed to get you back up in it, and you want to go to that uh, instructions for the requester of Forms 8 Ben, which in there it states that, you know, you can have a substitute form, uh, W8 Ben and a W8 IMY, and you can combine those forms also into one form. But when you do the substitute form, you only put in there what pertinent information that's really necessary because the, the form is nothing more than a form that sets up or declares under declaration of trust that you are uh, not a U.S. citizen. Right. Well, I'm, I'm already working on, with a friend, working on uh, a W-8-BIN in lieu of, you know, the, their form. And once we get the 8 Ben that up so we can use them, then what you're going to have to do is go back into the IRS because I found out that the 1040 form that you fill out, you're actually, that was a declaration, and declaration is one of the methods of formation of a trust, so you probably formed a separate trust with the IRS that you established yourself as trustee by filling out the 1040 form. So now you, you, you said established yourself on the 1040 with the IRS as you being the grantor, because you're the one who formed it, and you're the trustee. So you're grantor slash trustee. So now that's in conflict because all the other records of all other agencies must comport to the IRS record under the U.S. Attorney's Manual, USAM, under uh, that's, uh, statute, uh, let's see, 6.4.010, which basically says that the IRS is the master record file that all other agencies must comport to. So once we go back and correct that individual master file, uh, because right now as it stands, we set it up that we're a grant or trustee on that. And that doesn't match up with the Social Security because we're a grant or beneficiary on that one. So when we come into court, we claim that we're a grant or beneficiary. That's in direct conflict with the master file that we set up by the 1040 form that established us as trustee and not beneficiary. And they're probably looking at that record and say, well, all, you know, all other agencies must comport to that record, and you got yourself down as trustee, and then you come walking into court as beneficiary, and they say, oh, uh, this guy must be encompassed. We'll send him for a psych evaluation. Right. Does that sound like a lot of tapas to everybody? So now if we come back in, correct the master file over the long run, so the master file says that we are beneficiary to the trustee, not matches the Social Security account one, and they're not in conflict with one another. Right, so then we come home and eat out. Yeah, then we come in with our W-8 bins and make our claims of our status, and there is no conflicting information that says that when the intermediary asks, the re in other words, the requester of the forms for the W-8 series, which he wants to see whether or not you have this correct status so he can make the payment or the, the interest or the, uh, the income that it's not effectively connected with the source being connected to the United States business or trade. And it doesn't fall under withholding with the status established. And you're establishing your status as a non-resident alien then. And there's no other conflicting records that that's at, at odds with that. And now they must honor the W-8 Ben series and I and Y's because it matches well, that was, the IRS. Uh, that was another question, too. Uh, in, in doing a W-8 Ben in lieu of theirs, uh, would you want to be the intermediary? Uh, well, the intermediary is really a trustee. Well, they're third so, point, really. Uh, depends on what scenario you're working with, because you know, if you're working like a trust at the DTC, because the DTC is a trust, because your birth certificates and all the assets are held in trust there, and the intermediary or the trustee on that trust is really the DTC. But you say you you formed a trust that you know that's probably same different in what the IRS master file says. 
and they're they're probably saying that they're the beneficiaries. You know, so it's all like a mirror image backwards. But you have to treat like each scenario because we we probably set up many 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 master or sub trusts, and we need to start thinking them as not just one trust. There's many trusts. Okay, so important. We don't have the starting point, which would be the individual master files, is corrected first. Uh, I wouldn't be using any W8 bins until we did that. Uh, would that be something you'd need to go to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue with? That'd be the first place, because that way that's the principal, and get it all straightened around with him. Yeah. Okay, that's what I had. Thanks. Okay, let's see who we got up next here, Christian. Okay, uh, area code 404, state your first name, where are you calling from, please? Area code 404. There we go, 404, are you there? Area code 404, are you, are you on? Yeah, I'm one of the 404s, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? I'm DP from Atlanta. Hi, DP. Good to have you. Yeah, hi, Christian. Hi, how are you doing? All right. Uh, if you're a naturalized citizen, how does all this affect me? And I was over 18 when I became naturalized. Uh, you know, they still got you probably under the same system. It's It's... You know, no matter what country you came from, it's all about, you know, bonds and that, which is trust derivatives and things. So uh, somewhere along the line, I would start looking for the same kind of parallels. Okay. All right, thank you. Like your birth certificate would be your naturalization papers. Uh-huh. Do, do you have a birth certificate from your country? Uh, it got lost somewhere. <laughs> I think the naturalization paper was, was, was just the transfer of, to the United States, so to speak, uh, and now they're using the naturalization papers as an AKA, as a birth certificate. Okay. You know, it's probably been transferred to, say, up on the, uh, the DTC, where was that? Uh-huh. All right. Thank you. Thank you, DP. Okay, and uh, hit star one and mute yourself out and star, yeah, star one will mute you out, DP. Okay, uh, uh, Danny in Texas, I don't know if your hand is up or, or down. Uh, remember, everybody, when you're done, star one mutes you out and star five rate, drops your hand. And we're going to go to uh, uh, Charles Edward in uh, 703 area code. Charles Edward, where are you calling from? Yeah, I just go by Ed. I'm Ed, where are you calling from? Right up here outside of Washington, D.C. Okay, good to have you. Yes, I, I appreciate it, and thanks for taking my call. I'm, I'm uh, you know, right, on, right outside of the, uh, right outside of Babylon. But, okay. And you're, you're uh, real low. You're out, outside of Babylon, and they want to drain your audio. So speak up. I'm going to try to boost you. All right. Can you hear me okay? That's a little better. Keep on talking, Ed. You're okay. Keep on talking. Okay, good. I, I have a question, and, and, and I, I'm new at this, so my questions may seem naive, and, but I, I'd rather admit that and, and ask the most basic question. So, um, but what kind of trust is formed with a marriage, the marriage certificate and all, all of that, and that which gives the state the right to, to encroach into, you know, encroach into your life? Well, I don't think it makes too much of a difference what they call it, uh, whether they call it anything at all, you know, whether it be a uh, SESDK trust or I just call it, a, we're, we're expressing the trust, whatever trust name they call it. We're expressing that trust so that we're establishing that we're the grantor on it, and from grantor position, then we can set up the other two positions as we choose and see fit. Okay. <clears throat> well, um but is there something in that in that relationship that gives them the right to dictate uh, things about your kids, school, that that sort of thing, jurisdictional? Uh, um, and tax yeah, tax. if you're not uh, from the past shows, uh, what I talk about is in Gilbert's Law Summaries on page 19 under section 67, 
And also in the restatements on the second, uh, the law and trust in Section 23, where it says that no party in the trust needs to know or understand they are forming a trust. Now, that's the grant or the trustee or the beneficiary or anybody else. But that does not negate the fact that a trust is formed if all the necessary elements are there and the method of formation to prove the trust, if they exist, then there is a trust. But yet you didn't know or understand it. Right. And that's, when you didn't express the trust, that allows them to construe it. And they've got to construe it on their own bias bent the way they want it. And they want it under debt or creditor law, which is really statutes and codes. Because that's the rules that they're operating by. So that's what puts you under statutes and codes. Okay. By operation of law. Right. What does it mean to express the trust? Well, that sounds esoteric. What does it mean in practical terms? Well, it starts with really the rule of signatures, which in expressing the trust by the rule of signatures, which you have to give your signature starting by a qualifier with your signature, say by grantor and signature, by trustee and signature or by beneficiary in the signature. You have to restrict your signatures in some way so that you can establish yourself as, as the, the grantor to start out with so that you can come in and claim and do the trust purpose, whatever your intent purpose is or was. Set up the parties and identify the specific trust res and then have one of the methods of formation because you're setting up a relationship between a... A uh, relationship with specific trust property with a, another party called a trustee so that that is for the benefit of somebody else named the beneficiary. And that trustee's got the duty to administer or distribute the, the trust, whatever the purpose or intent was set up by the grantor. But you see, they're, they're tricking us in their realm to get the... Uh, trust construed under debtor-creditor because we didn't know or understand, and according to that, those sections that I read, I quoted from, no party needed to know or understand what was really going on. So that's the whole key. Once you know and understand that it's all about a trust, and then you walk in knowing the elements and the method of formation, and then now you can really say, I know and understand what my intent and purpose is, instead of allowing them because you didn't express it, and in expressing the trust, what it was, your intent and purpose. Because they're waiting for you to give the instructions on the indenture, but you never gave the instructions. And they're sitting there saying, well, you know, you dropped the ball. we got to do something with this property, this trust res. So let's, let's use it the way we want to until this fellow starts waking up. Prescription. Remember, prescription was the effect of lapsed time in creating and destroying the rights. Now, in the realm of legal language, what language is synonymous with that that's more commonly used? Okay, that being uh, some of the first time I've heard it expressed that way. Uh, acquiescence, silence. Yes, right. The lapsed time, that's acquiescence. You didn't express the trust within a certain time. The time elapsed and they destroyed your rights. They okay. put them in trust and held them there until you finally wake up. Okay. And they put you under debt or creditor, and now your, your trust receipt, which was a record of a payment, turns into a 30-year debt contract on a mortgage, say. Yes. Where can... Uh, somebody like myself go to become more versed. I'm a diligent student, but I like to go to the root of things, which is what you're doing here. I, I, um, so where can I go to learn more about this? In a, uh, um, what's the best way to become versed and proficient? All right. Uh, you want to send me an email at movingtitles at hotmail.com. Let me request for the download link page, and I'll send you a page full of downloads. And you want to go from like 11, 7, and forward till now because that's all on NTT, which is new trust technology that we're using. And that'll get you the, the links that you can listen to the audios and get caught up. So that's what we're really we're talking about is, is, you know, we're talking about NTT, which is new trust technology. 
but really trust has been around for a long time. It's just that we're recognizing trust, how they're being used, and that's what's revolutionary or new about the trust, and that's the technology we're using. Moving titles at hotmail.com? Yes, moving titles at hotmail.com. So, and what you're teaching also can, is in, in this, there's administrative remedy for all the dysfunction. Oh, yeah, well, well the trusts today are being used for asset protection. A lot of people out there are teaching about trust, but they're only teaching for asset protection under debtor creditor so that the creditors don't come take your assets. We're teaching about trust technology, new trust technology as a remedy. We're using trust as a remedy, not as a defense. We're using it as an offense. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll send that email to you, okay? Right. And I'll let somebody else talk. I appreciate it. I don't want to monopolize. Thank you, Christian. <coughs> Come back in if you got another question. Okay. Yeah. And star one, mute you out, and star five, drops your hand. Have you got another question? Uh, it's unknown. Please state your first name. Where are you calling from? Unknown. You got a question? State your first name. Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Who, do have, who do we have? It's Pete from England. Hi, Pete. Good to have you. Thank you, Jim. How are you doing? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the thing. Hopefully you can bring some remedy to my situation or help me along with what I've been uh, doing. Um, I got a, an offer for summons to a cause back in November, which I refused for cause and I signed this grant or beneficiary. And I returned it back to Origin, which was a, a different county from where I am. And, um, and in, the, in the meantime, I went to the court in Liverpool where it was proposed to be, and I asked, you know, for information on the case. And he said, oh, we can't give you any information on that. We don't find out until the day before. So I said, well, can you sign this under penalty of perjury to say that, um, you know, that you're refusing to give information about the case? So they said, no, we won't, we won't sign it. So I said, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, so I left. And then two days before the case was about to happen, uh, a letter came through from the solicitors who um, had sent a letter to Pryor saying that, you know, he has no standing with me as there's no contract, as I was thinking then, uh, between us. And, you know, I can only refuse his... Um, refuse his entrance into the contract that I have with my landlord because this is the case that I'm dealing with. So then this thing came uh, through the door and I'm looking at it and it says that he's intending to take me to the court two days later. So I went to the court and the judge asked me the name and I said, uh, I'm beneficiary of that account and I appoint you trustee. And he said, oh, right, I can't be trustee. I'm, I'm a judge. So then, um, as he was talking, he, he like completed the sentence, and I was about to talk, and he said, "Excuse me, we don't interrupt in this place." And I said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you'd finished, So, if you'd like to carry on, and then he thought of something to say, and then let me speak. And then when I was speaking, the opponent he started to speak. He said, "May I interrupt there?" And the judge said, "Yeah." And I said, excuse me, you just said that there's no interruption in here. Are you favouring the other side? Like? And he said, no, just let the gentleman clarify what it is that he's trying to bring to light. So we um, acted upon a, a contract, which was a 12-month contract from 2006. And uh, they have the postcode wrong. But the judge gave an order for the possession to take place in 14 days, and that was last Tuesday. So I'm just wondering how I can uh, sort of back up what I've done, which is I've charged the uh, landlord for a million pounds uh, for breach of contract. And I've also set a fee schedule at 500 pounds a day, dating back from August. And I've also um, claimed myself as lien title holder, and I've had no... Uh, no rebuttal to that, 
but I did rebut their notice when they sent me a notice in the in the in the first place. Okay, I would say that you know for what you told me so far that I, I would treat the whole thing as a trust, the case itself, and yes. turn that into a trust property and make a special deposit. But before I did all that, I would have to make sure that I got the the trust uh, evidence there that I could prove that I have a trust. And then when that judge would have asked me, uh, basically what he said was, you know, we don't have a trust here. And that would have been when I would have walked up with the Mack truck to drive through there to prove the trust. Now, I was unsure whether to do that in the open forum of the court, because I did ask him, would he come into chambers while I disclosed to him? I have an affidavit of truth where it says that I'm a man and I have unalienable rights by uh, right of God and, you know, some other things. And he refused to go into chambers. He said, this is confidential enough. I said, well, I don't accept that. And then when he came to the end of the case, he said, I'm giving the order. And I said, I don't accept. And he said, well, at that point, we'll close the case. Oh, he said that. <laughs> so but I know the case. What was the order? That's what I imagine it to be. Now, what, what I'm getting to is the point where, you know, how can I enforce the thing? Into, in the 14 days or get some verification that the case is closed, how do I need to operate? Well, if I would quickly, you know, you've got to establish the evidence that you're, that there is a trust, and then I would treat the whole thing as a trust deposit. And I would come so, at them probably with a, an independent action against them, and you, you bring, like, your counterclaim in that it is a trust this time. And then I would probably seek an injunction and get the whole thing put a stay on somehow so that the action doesn't proceed while this this new counterclaim is heard. And now we're talking about trust. So he brought his claim against you under debtor-creditor, but I'm going to come in with counterclaim being trust. So, so I'm not going to i got to have to make sure that i got the evidence to prove the trust. And I would put all my bills and stuff that I was charging him that was the dishonor created that would be the asset. Include that as trust res. Right, I see. Yeah, so the million that I've charged the, uh, the landlord and the 500 pounds a day. Yeah, so his his claim that he comes at you with debtor creditor, that, that formed a trust. I would treat that as a trust plus your bills that you've made now and treat that also with, as a trust, the same trust, and then come at them under breach of trust because they've breached the special deposit. So where's, where's my power coming from with this? Like, do I need to, you know, Board of buy equity. Board of equity. Board. Because now if it's a trust, if you prove trust after you claim trust, now you've got a court of equity because... Trust operates solely in equity. And then you can compel the trustee to do his duty and just do the disbursement out of the special deposit or pay the bill or do the conversion under uh, statement of re-seconds, uh, I think it's 342, I believe, or no, I might be wrong on that one. Let me just look here. Which would be the conversion. Yeah, 342, that's the direction to convert under the restatement of the seconds. Yeah. So I do the direction to convert trust res property and then distribute the fund, pay the bill. I was also going to be trying to do the massive car sell as well. I didn't hear that last part. Sign is what? Try and come at them, you know, where they'd operate as a car sell on the antitrust. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to go that far because I could turn the heat up as I go, but I, I would definitely come in as a um, you know, breach of trust. If they did commingle the funds, didn't give me the funds back when I asked for the disbursement, uh, then you could get them for conversion. 
which would be fraudulent transfer also. So these would be causes of action, as well as breach of trust, breach of uh, trustee duty. And then I would say the, the last one, you know, the antitrust for, for last if I had to. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Christian. I'll, I'll be re-listening to what you've just said about 60 times and decipher everything. Okay, and uh, Pete, what's the weather like out there in England? Uh, absolutely freezing, and it snowed about four or five inches thick. And the city where I live, they all did no salt, so all the roads are all uh, like ice, just ice rivers. Are you, have, are you having record colds over there in England right now? Uh, I wouldn't say record, no. About, about average for the time of year, it's about minus five. I see. That's five uh, Celsius, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, because we're having record colds down here in Georgia and uh, and also out in Nebraska and uh, other parts of the country, uh, New York. So I uh, just uh, heard that you were having your share over there as well. So uh, good to have you. You, you, you uh, Even though you're in England, you sound like you've got more of an Irish accent. Are you Irish? Yeah. Well, I'm Irish by descent. I'm third generation Irish in England. Well, we're, we're, we may be related. I'm a, tw I'm a quarter Irish, so uh, good to have you on the network. Thanks so much, Desert Owl. Um, I've got about $25 there for you, but I don't know how to get them to you. Well, you can stick them in an envelope if you want. I sure do appreciate that. Uh, uh, just go to our uh, contact page, and our mailing location is there, Pete. Okay, I will. Hey, very good, and uh, send a postcard, but uh, we're here to serve, and... Uh, let us know if we can do anything for you, and, uh, and I'll tell you what, be sure to include your email, or tell you what, go ahead and send me your email, uh, you know, by through our contact email, and I'll send you some of uh, the uh, translations that I'm doing uh, for it to thank you, okay? Thanks, thanks very much, yeah, I look forward to it. Okay, Pete, good, good to talk to hey, you. Hey, on sir. page uh, 65, Pete, uh, this is under the section on trust purposes, which starts on 64, but... Uh, under the section 227 in the book, yeah. it's talking about impermissible trust purposes. So if they're misconstruing the trust because you didn't express the trust properly, so they're they're using the trust uh, impermissible trust purposes wrong. So they're using it impermissible. That's where the misconstruement comes in. So then they have the uh, 228, section 228 is fraud on the creditors. But then they're talking about causes of action in here under one under the effects and and on forward. Uh, so it's talking about fraudulent transfer there. And the uh, unclean hands doctrine yeah. and also unjust enrichment yeah. as well as with, say, commingling and uh, conversion under the special deposit. And then Is also... Also, it's talking about unfair business practices there also, and unfair business practices, fraud, misrepresentation, or unconscionable acts and practices against consumers. And then that brings in where the, the antitrust is, because really if, if they're using the trust improperly for trust purposes, contrary to the grantor, then really they're impeding commerce, and that's a monopoly. Anything that impedes commerce is a monopoly. And really you have an unfair advantage because they got legal knowledge and you don't. So is this at the judge or at the party? Well, I don't know if yeah, I want to come at the judge. The judge right there said that he didn't, he couldn't be the trustee. What, what I would also said was at that moment, Your Honor, the, there is a resulting trust that has been formed, and now you must uh, appoint a successor trustee because you really disclaimed on the trust. But what I'm thinking there is uh, getting the transcript and setting the record straight and writing that on the transcript. Would that work? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, you're on the one side. He's coming at you with his claim, and you didn't. I don't think you properly proved that you had a trust. So I would come oh. back in with a counterclaim and, and come back in with a trust as a breach of trust. But this time, be prepared to prove the trust. 
because that's the first thing you're going to have to do. And then put all the private information in, in chambers and do the in-camera hearing. Probably have to put a protective order on that. I don't know how it is in, in England there, but over here, protective order is a setup that you need for claiming that it's it's secret or CCI information. Yeah, I'm sure I can uh, manage that. So, just to clarify, I'm coming at the uh, the other party with these things on the trust, but I'm also putting in the judge in because of the resulting trust, and I'm expressing the trust to him now in camera. You might have to have a... If you came in with a counterclaim, uh, would the judge be the same judge? Or is it too late to come already got his order in there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about enough about English law over there. So that's the same as a in with an independent case and do a, a countersuit, a whole new case, and sue that case, and then treat this all as a trust, the first case as a trust, as trust property, trust res property, and put it all in a special deposit. Okay, I'll work with what you've told me so far. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, Christian. Okay, uh, in uh, England, good to have you. And then uh, anybody else out there, you have to hit star five to raise your hand. Anybody on the internet, if you want to get in on the uh, conference line here, you can ask Christian Walters a question. Once you get on the conference line, you just hit star five, that raises your hand, and love to have you, okay? If this is uh, new to you, don't feel that uh, you, know, you can't ask a question because uh, it's uh, new to everybody at one point. It's... Uh, uh, you get your head spinning, you know, but you, you've got to start uh, with the fundamentals if you're not familiar with it, right? Okay, so uh, we've got somebody, 865 area code, state your first name, where are you calling from, 865? Uh, this is uh, Trey. Uh, I sent a letter to my bank. Yeah, Trey, where are you calling from? Trey. Ten Tennessee. Tennessee, good to have you. Yeah. Yeah, I got a letter, or I sent a letter to my bank. And uh, they misconstrued it as me challenging or asking them to discharge the note. They sent me copies of uh, the note, the deed of trust, and the cover letter, and a lot of statements. But what they, what I found out was they sent me a copy of the note. It has the allonge on it. So I'm wondering, um, since it has the allonge on it, uh, you know, pay to the order without recourse, you know, the name of the bank, then the vice president's signature. Uh, what would be the easiest way to uh, uh, get them to uh, release the note and reconvey the property? Does it show on there that they've uh, securitized the note in any way? I don't see how. No, well, I mean, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, does your court caption heading, do you have like a, a complaint that they are coming at you with? or is you no, 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 no. No, 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 nothing. There's not. They're not coming after me. I'm my. I'm current with my payments and everything. Okay. Um, so no, they, have they transferred the note in any way? Yes, uh, the original bank has transferred it or sold the note to uh, the servicing company. All right, uh, that right there proves that they commingled the funds under trust law. So now, if I claim it being a trust to start out with, then. Uh, that was in special deposit. I was supposed to get the same thing back. So if they transferred it, they weren't supposed to transfer it. That was a breach of trust right there. But they also took the note. Uh, prove the trust first. Same thing I was telling Pete. Everything is the same thing. you got to claim trust first and then prove that trust that you are and you have a trust. But they also they took the note, which they were supposed to hold as a security, and converted it to an asset and deposited it like a check and loaded it out to themselves. And that's conversion. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's conversion, right. So, but the, the first thing is to, you know, prove the trust. Well, he claims easy. trust, trust. Max Isn't that, easy to do? Isn't that easy to do with the deed of trust? I mean, it was a trust relationship. No, 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 no. That, the deed of trust is another trust. Because we're dealing with multiple trusts here. The closing was one trust. 
setting up the note of the trust. And then you went in the county and recorded the deed in there. You formed another trust. Okay. So it's like we have to track where we signed our signatures and make sure that everything tied to this is, you know, because every place where you sign your signature could be another trust. So if you sign multiple documents at closing, you better make sure that they're all one trust or treat them as one trust. Okay. Any other new signatures on any other thing could be a possible multiple trust. Okay, so what would be the easiest thing to uh, to do? I mean, like... Well, it sounds like we're pretty new to what we've been talking about. Uh, the, I would suggest to, you know, send me an email so you got the download so you can go through some of the download links since November. So November, December is really where we, we switched to NTT, New Trust Technology. And everything we've been talking about on all the shows since that time is we, I've gone completely away from debtor creditor. I'm gone strictly trust. Well, I've asked on your, uh, the audio downloads, and I'll send you a link that you can get those and start there. And you need to get this Gilbert's Law Summary book on trust. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah, start going along with the audios and comparing, you know, go along with it. Well, the thing that's different, you know, because, I mean, uh, I didn't realize till last week that they had sent me the note with the allonge on it, so I'm thinking that's that's a bit of a different uh, scenario instead of having to approach it with all of this other uh, uh, business about expressing the trust, because they've already breached Yeah, well, you're talking debtor-creditor, and my, I just do not go there, because I, I think debtor-creditor is, is ineffective. Except for value under debtor creditor and all the other stuff that we've been doing in the past, and I've done it just as well as everybody else, it has no consistency of success and can't claim anything about that. Even though I've had success under set offs and discharges uh, with no consistent rate, and the reason why is just what I what I talked about at the beginning of the show is because really you're under a discretionary trust, and it's per the discretion of the bankruptcy trustee. And he is not making the payments. He's not making the set-offs, only if it suits his purpose. And his purpose is to give you a little bit here and there, a dog bone, to keep us all on the debtor-creditor path going the wrong direction. We need to be going the opposite direction in trust, treating all these trusts with trust as a trust because you were the signer that formed the trust on all this stuff. Now, if you come at them with trust breaches, now you got the 900-pound gorilla, of which you are, and it makes a difference between night and day. I think we're going to see a dramatic increase in the success of our consistency of our uh, our processes by not doing debt or credit, by doing trust. But that option is up to you. I can't answer that for you. If you know debt or credit or better, maybe that should be the way that you should go until you learn this trust. But if you don't have any problems, I'd suggest that you just study trust until you do uh, understand it better to where you can come in and take control of this whole thing as a trust. So, you see, the remedy is not in debtor-credit relationship as secured party creditor. The remedy is in trust. It's commerce through trust and equity. Knowing who you are is not knowing that you're secured party creditor. No, knowing who you are is really knowing that you're grantor. It's all trust. So if I didn't have a problem, I would study the trust and come at them under breach of trust later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Okay. Hey, and by the way, go ahead, Chuck. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, take notice and acknowledgement and agreement that this show and or documents is private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for individual legal situations or employed for making legal decisions. And when you will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and or documents are for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. 
by accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents there, and you understand with agreement that with all rights reserved, without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in the preparation or the use therein reference has no interest in any issue referenced therein and is not a party to this or any action arising from and is only acting in an authorized capacity as liaison to communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and our show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached herein by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party may become liable for admiralty commercial damages of $100 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walter's discretion. Thank you for your understanding. And if anybody out there, uh, I know we have a lot of people online. I'm surprised we don't have more hands. Star 5 will raise your hand. If anybody has a comment or a question they just want to bring it on Skype, uh, then, you know, you can do that. I'd be glad to take your question and read it to uh, Christian. I actually have one here, Christian. Uh, the uh, party says, I took some CDs, cashed them in, uh, and CDs being certificates of deposit, cashed them in and purchased some coins for bartering purposes. How do I put those coins into a trust when I hold these coins? And, sh and uh, she's talking about gold and silver, apparently. How to put the coins in trust. Yeah. Well, if she wants to be, there's two ways. You could have either that you're the grantor, the trustee, or she could be grantor and beneficiary. And remember, the trustee is the one who has control and has legal title to the coins. But that's for the purpose of the beneficiary. So you need three parties to set up a trust. Grantor, trustee, and beneficiary. But then it just depends how you want to set this trust up and how you want to operate it. So I don't know what you, your intent is or what your purpose is because you didn't really specify. So that's about as far as we can go. You know, I don't know intent and purpose of the grantor, which would be her, and uh, how to set the parties up, which would be the three parties and obviously the specific trust res would be uh, the coins. Yeah. You certainly, when you're setting up a, a trust, there's a lot of trust been offered over the years. I've seen out there, and I've seen them get, you know, the, 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 uh, the busting crew, the IRS, comes and busts those trusts. We heard about that going on. And, um, and then I uh, had an experience where someone offered to create a trust for me, Christian, and they just literally uh, cost me a year of my life and, and my work, and, and just did nothing but injure me throughout the entire process. So that's certainly a liability when I wanted to find someone to um, uh, be the, uh, the trustee or manager of the, of the trust, right? Yeah, yeah. But what comes to mind is what we used 21 silver dollars for in the past was we created silver surety bonds. And what we did is we had uh, the coins were being held in trust which we didn't realize at that time. Yeah. Okay, the, uh, the, uh, the follow-up is regarding that uh, question with the coins and the CDs, uh, and uh, it's, it's regarding getting out of a marriage. So I guess the implication is to separate uh, these assets as being uh, uh, in her uh, valuable possessions and not wanting them to become part of some, uh, uh, you know, uh, a kangaroo court, uh, which is what the Attorney's Guild is all about. I don't know, but she wants to put all her assets in trust before she... Uh, yeah, get, yeah. Well, you see, now she doesn't have clear title to pass title into the trustee. She's got a problem there, because she's married. She can only put her half, probably, in trust. And which is her half? We don't know if it's 60-40, uh, I mean, 60-40, 50-50, or what, you know. We have no way of establishing. And now, now you're in a pickle because you didn't start out with a trust to begin with. 
Okay, very good. We have other hands raised. Let's go uh, to um, area code 703. Please state your first name. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Kim from Nowhere. Hi, Kim. Good to have you. Thank you. Um, this is, I guess, another follow-up question regarding the marriage license and um, expressing, I guess, the trust when you're signing the marriage license. So I just wanted to clarify um, with the marriage license, if I sign the document, you know, by grantor, you know, my name, um, authorized representative without prejudice, would that be an example of expressing the trust at that point in time when I'm signing it? Uh, that's where it starts, yeah, because if you sign it with a qualifier by grantor, that's establishing that the, you're grantor on some kind of a trust. Okay. And so when I do, so, and so once I, do that, does that mean that when I get married, like, will our assets, my assets, his assets come together, or will they still be separate? Yeah, you're forming one trust, and you're both of you are putting your assets in trust. But then you were, you were forming the trust, uh, but then you didn't uh, express it to be a trust. Now, they're going to construe it under debt or credit or under state law, and you fall under uh, statutes and codes and probate, and everything else. But, so the but like said, trust, and it starts with expression of, by, by giving a qualified signature. But then you got to start thinking about intent, purpose, party, specific res, and a method of formation, and have the evidence created to be able to prove a trust somewhere down the line. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. What it boils down to is, is creating the records that I have intent and purpose and parties and specific res and either by declaration, transfer, or appointment, or contract set up one of the methods to form the trust, which is really the formation of the trust forms when specific trust res is transferred to a trustee. At that present transfer, that's when the trust is formed. So I have to create records of that to prove the trust. And that's, that's basically what we're talking about on these calls all the time. Right. How to create records to prove the trust, which is part of the expression of the trust. Because if I'm expressing that it is a trust, you know, when I get into court, I'm just going to say, well, I don't see a trust. Thank you. Yeah, Kim, just go ahead and uh, hit the star and uh, start one that will meet you out. Apparently, Christian dropped off, so we're going to just uh, do a little uh, two-minute blurb here. Christian Walters, back on the air. Good to have you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good, Christian. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I pretty much finished up with that one last question, so... Yeah, okay, we've got, uh, that, that good. Put, I'm going to put your hand down, and let's see who we have here. Oh, we've got we've got no shortage of hands now. Uh, we're going to take uh, one that hasn't had a chance yet. Uh, we've got 325 area code. State your first name. Where are you calling from? 325 area code. State your first name. Where are you calling from? Well... Wait a minute. That didn't work. Let me try it again. 325 area code. State your first name. Where are you calling from? What well, do we have? A sticky button here? Okay. I'm going to try it again. Hello? There we go. Who is this? Where are you calling from? This is Michael from Texas. Good to have you, Michael. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very... Uh, educational what Christian's been teaching and uh, uh, just to say a kind word to him uh, thank you and then also uh, the song that you like the Indian song that he played right? it has the name Yahweh in it the Indians used to worship Yahweh's and um, I'm in the process right now with Terry and he's emailed you a couple times and cutting down the tree the entire tree 
And if we can talk to you on a private basis, email us back and let us know because the information is kind of private and I really don't want to put it over the radio. But with that, I turn it back over. Does send me an email with your Skype name in there? Um, no, um, I'm going to have to sign up for Skype, but I'll go ahead and do that tonight and then go ahead and email because I'm going after a whole ball of wax. <laughs> Great. Best way, really. All right. And, and All right. Our, yeah, our Skype name here, uh, Michael and everybody else, is Free America Radio. Free America Radio is one word, and you'll get the confirmation uh, in Kingsland, Georgia, is a location of Free America Radio. If anybody wants uh, to do a file transfer also of the programming, uh, we can do a file transfer in the morning uh, and uh, just make any size donation, any size donation, and we'll be glad to get you uh, the audio, the entire day program of today um, in one uh, transfer file. Uh, and uh, so, but um, Michael, I didn't mean to interrupt, and if you have a follow up with uh, Christian. Uh, one last thing is that um, I got in the tail end of the 1-6, and I'd really like, or 1-5, one, one and I'd really like to get a copy of that, but I've been studying this for seven years, and um, what, you're, what you've been teaching, and uh, I have to commend you on it, is great work, because the bottom line is that we have to take care of each other, and uh, we have to get the right mindset in, in that, and... Uh, be sons of Yahweh in doing this. And with that, I turn it over and uh, talk to you guys later. Okay, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, Michael, hit star one. That'll meet you out, please. And now let's go to, uh, let's see, we've got Rhonda in Missouri. Good to have you, Rhonda. Here every week. Hello. Come on in. Hello. You're there, Rhonda. Go ahead. I'll boost you. Speak up. Rhonda, where'd you go? Well, let's see. She's unmuted. R Rhonda, come on in. Hello? Yeah, you're there. Uh, speak up. I don't know what the problem is, but I'm trying to boost your audio. Go ahead. Hi, Christian. Hi, Rhonda. How are you doing? I'm good. I just want to say hi, and I'll shout you an email on your new email. I want like to uh, put in to be one of your ambassadors. Okay. Any snakes down your way? No, they're staying. They're staying clear of me right now. Oh, all the heads off. All right. That's right. Okay, just uh, wanted to let you know that. Say, want to say hi and uh, thanks for everything. Uh, no questions. Uh, I think I'm pretty much getting the foundation down, so I'm gonna let other people kind of work with you on the foundation, and I'd just like to. Maybe get to be one of your ambassadors so I could continue. Well, maybe you can express to the people how important it is to get the book so they can follow along with what I'm talking about. Oh, I, I really love the book. It's, uh, like you said, double space typing. It's big print. It's uh, easy to follow along. It's, it's kind of hard when you're jumping through the pages there, so what, what I do is... I take notes and write down the pages as you're talking, and then it's easier to go back through the book and look at it. But Did you yeah, get, I, yeah, what copyright date is on yours? I got the 2008. 2008. Does yeah. it have the same ISBN number? I imagine it does. Yeah. I, I gave somebody the ISBN number before the same one as I that I have, but they looked it up on the internet and said it was 2007. So I don't I don't know. But anyway. Now this is 2008. I just had to luck out and get the right one. So, okay, well, I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thanks, Rhonda. Appreciate it. Oh. Okay, Rhonda, thank you. And uh, hit star five and bring your hand down and star one on mute you. And now we're going to go to uh, uh, Dan in California. Hello, how you guys doing? I'm okay. All right. Yeah, hey. good, good. Hey, Christian. Um, I had a quick question on claiming title on a UCC, on a financing statement. Uh, if I wanted to claim uh, the notes, the trust dress property, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, unique identifying number is on that. I know they gave it one to put it in their trust, 
but then how would I identify my trust res property on a financing state? Okay, I go to the post office and get a registered mail uh, red sticker. Oh, okay. I stick that on a, an envelope and to put something in an envelope, like a blank piece of paper folded up, and send that to myself. Okay. And when it canceled, that number becomes yours. And then that would gotcha. be the number that I would use on any kind of documentation. Okay. Yeah, I've heard you say that before. I just, it just didn't, I guess it didn't just click till now. Okay. Make sure then, that uh, you cancel the number. Don't just get one of those stickers and use it. You got to stick it on an envelope and cancel it by sending it to yourself. Okay. Or send it to somebody else, you know, something like that. So you, somebody, you know, a friend, and go go get the number then so they then you can claim that on UCC one. Okay, and then um, also it, it seems to me that that this everything we're doing in the private, as far as setting up trust, proving trust, um, creating trust, grantorship, and everything, um, it, that's the ultimate goal. Then is to is to walk into equity in an in camera hearing and, and present all that in front of the judge. Is that correct? Right, because in equity, you're in a different ball game. There now, equity must, uh, you know, is on your side. Okay, because that's so the grantor, the beneficiary, can enforce the trust, enforce the trustee. The court of equity will force him to do his duty. Will compel him to do his duty, and that's that. Com that compelling uh, or compulsion is is through equity. So, so you also so have equity in at law, which you come at with at law claims causes of action, you know, for the breach. Mm -hmm. So that would be at law. And then you also have commercial remedies. You could you could do a commercial remedy also simultaneously. You have three actions going simultaneously with this. Equity, right. at law, and commercial. Okay. All being so, trust res a special deposit. So let's let, let's say we I restate the trust, restate my intentions, can prove grantorship, and then um, uh, make a notice and demand for the trust res property to be returned. And then obviously it's not going to. And then I issue a uh, uh, a default for breach of uh, fiduciary duty. But then then that all gets claimed on a UCC one, and then. Then at that point we just we we go into court from there. I'm not interacting with the other party anymore at that point, right? Uh, yeah. Once you confirm that there was a, a special deposit made, I'd say like an UCC one. Then I can use the three as a transfer, you know, into deposit. And the deposit was made to the trustee, and that must be kept as non-commingled funds. And if they took out a trust from the trustee, say or whoever had the specific property, you know, like if they securitized the note or something, or you know, then they breach the, the trust. Mm -hmm. So it's a breach of trustee duty instead of a breach of fiduciary duty because it's it's a trustee ship. Okay. Breach and then uh trustee because I've, I've heard you say before that the uh, the title companies were the initial trustees, but then if you look at the uh, the S3 filings, the, uh, their own uh, um, trust indentures and their pooling and servicing agreements, there's a there's another trustee as well, usually like another bank. Um, and so are, are we talking two different trustees here? Or are they? Well, yeah, we're talking two different trustees, uh, which c could possibly be two different trusts. Now, they, they transfer to, say, out of one trustee deposit and put it in something unbeknownst to myself. But they did that only because they had debtor creditors standing to do that because I never expressed the trust to begin with. But that would show that they breached the, the trust, and under even under debtor creditor under 9-336 under UCC, that was commingling of funds right there. Right. And commingling would be a breach of trust deposit, which okay. is synonymous with special deposit. Special deposit and trust deposit are, are synonymous. Right, because they didn't give us a, a, a trust deposit receipt would be a, a security agreement and a, and a you No, know, you should be issuing the receipt. You see, because you're the bank on a trust. You're, you're the bank. You're the one making the deposit. 
And if you're the bank, you should be issuing the certificate of a deposit. But see, you never issued the certificate of deposit because, see, you should have been creating the evidence to prove that you were the trust or the you were creating evidence all along that it was a trust, and you never did. You never made out a certificate of deposit to prove that you made a, a special deposit, and then you never done anything at all, really. And here all along, they're creating evidence of all kinds of contracts and things that you signed, which was the insurance policy, in case you didn't make it closing the, the expression of the trust and told them what to do with the trust deposit, the note that you, that you did. And you never did that. So they're setting up all these debtor-creditor contracts, and they got all these records to prove that you're under debtor-creditor. And here we don't have any records to prove that we are under trust. And we need to start learning how to create the records so we can prove all these trust deposits that we're going to make or have made. I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm ready to learn. I've got Gilberts. I've got... You know, I've been listening to the calls and, and uh, uh, kind of like Rhonda, I'm slowly building a foundation. Uh, I just uh, want to take it to the next level as soon as possible. So Black's Law 4th uh, edition says that trust deposit is where money or property is deposited to be kept intact and not commingled with other funds or property of bank, remember you're the bank, and is to be returned in kind to the depositor. If you can't get your note back, they breach the special deposit right. on a mortgage, for example. And then continuing on, or devoted to a particular purpose, there's trust purpose right there, or requirement of depositor, or the payment of particular debts or obligations of depositor, also called special deposit. So special deposit is synonymous with trust deposit, but then again, I was quoting, or requirement of depositor or payment of particular debts or obligations of the depositor. And then I'm going to tie in that section 342 under this restatements, a second law on trust, which says upon the conversion. So we're going to convert trust res property to, say, cash and pay the debt. And that was my purpose. But I never expressed it to be a trust, never gave the, the conversion instructions, never gave the special deposit instructions. Do you think we have a trust? Never nope. came up and proved the trust, never even claimed the trust. But yet they got all these contracts on a debtor creditor that I owe a mortgage. Oh, and they're yeah. right. But they're right. They're right. I'm not, I'm not disputing that at all. I, I looked at, you know, uh, I'm looking at what they have on me, and it's and you're right, it's endless. They got they got all kinds of stuff. So I, I'm just looking to to see how to reverse that. Well, here's the reversal. What you want to do is you want to, uh, the definition of trust receipt in Black's Law Eighth Edition now. Eighth Edition it says trust receipt. It's a pre UCC security device. Well, you never knew that UCC was trust, but it is. Right. A pre-UCC security device now governed by Article 9 of the code consisting of a receipt. And everybody knows a receipt is a record of a payment. So a receipt stating that the wholesale buyer has possession of the goods for the benefit of the financier. And today there usually must be a security agreement coupled with a filed financing statement. And that filed financing statement is a UCC-1. And that UCC-1 coupled with a security agreement if you would express the trust, would have been a trust receipt. But since you express it to be a trust receipt, it now becomes UCC one your security agreement now becomes a debtor creditor contract where the insurance policy kicks in and now you've got to make payments for the next thirty years. So now all we gotta do is come back and claim a trust, be able to prove the trust with the material facts, and then come in with the proof that we made a special deposit and uh, start coming in, in with breaches of the trust and coming at them with the counterclaims of being trust and trust, trust breaches and everything else that I, same thing I said to Pete there. Conversion and the other. Yeah, conversion. Uh, unjust and Roger and transfer. And then the ultimate kicker, the big one, the antitrust. Antitrust, All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, 
Chris and I have got one here uh, by Skype. Uh, it would be very helpful to me if step-by-step, a uh, step-by-step explanation will be given on how to prove the existence of my trust. Thanks. Okay, that's really going to be talked about in the uh, Moving Titles Workshop, the NTT Workshops. Okay. We're really going to get into, you know, the, the specifics and the actual paperwork and things in the workshop. Okay. It turned out, gonna... yeah, it's turned out to be a little more uh, in depth than what I've uh, set up so far, and you know, we're playing around with dim dim and different things, getting things set up for the workshop. So, yeah. okay, we've got um, a follow up. It looks like with DP in Atlanta. DP, uh, you there? Yeah. Hi, Christian. Uh, Desert Al, what is your real name? Uh, Des- uh, I think I'm real. Oh, okay. well, I, I, uh, I used to live in St. Mary's in uh, Fernandina Beach. Okay. Back to 81 through 90. It's a nice area. Where do you mean? In here down there at Kingsland? Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, I just moved here uh, two months ago. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, well, I had yeah some friends uh, come and rescue me. They were trying to kill me down there, so I had to relocate. I, I periodically have to move. Uh, with, uh, it's, it's dangerous when you're telling the truth in a sea of lies. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I get into a cobweb down there, too, so... I don't know if it's safe there either. <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, it's not safe anywhere in this world, I don't think, anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, Christian, I really value what you teach. Uh, I've only been in at this for about three months, and there's so much information you don't know sometimes. You get overwhelmed on what is the right direction, but as soon as I heard you, I kind of, you know, just knew that it was the right way. But uh, I've got, like, three questions. One of uh, the first question has got three parts, and I think you answered part of that. How important is the UCC-1? And I filed it uh, using Tim Turner's process, and that's probably the wrong way to approach it, I'm sure. Uh, how do I get how the proper way to fill out the UCC-1? And also I've heard that it should be a non-UCC filing. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to use it as a non-UCC filing, right? Okay. And how do I get how to properly fill it out? Where? Well, you see, a lot of people don't understand that UCC, that those terms in there really change according to it. I think it's line seven, where you, like, check, say, Baylor Bailey or Lisey, 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 or, you know. Right. As soon as you check one of those blocks, all the other terms on the form now change to those terms. It's no longer secured party creditor or another uh, debtor up there. You know, they changed to conform to those, the little block that you checked. Mm-hmm. Really, on block eight, I could put in there, say, grantor slash trustee, and that could be a block I'm going to set the whole thing to, really. So the, your first block is debtor. That's probably going to be you know, comporting to, say, trustee. Whoever the trustee is, he's going to be like the debtor. And then your secured party creditor, that's going to be your secured party is going to be the, the grantor. Okay. That's me. And there's a question that's about the block on the uh, page there. Somebody may not want I was looking at it. So they put the check block under the trust, and it's the one next to it. I think it needs to be checked. We're talking about the trustee. I don't have the form of acting, county, right? Uh, acting on behalf of the trustee or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's what it says, yeah. That's the one I checked. I filed three different ones, one in Washington, one here in Georgia. The one in Washington, because you could do it online, they don't have online here in Georgia. Then somebody told me that I should file where I was naturalized, which was Indiana. So when I went over Christmas time to Indiana... Under under, uh, Tim Turner's process, it probably makes a difference where you file. We're not using it that way. We're just using it to create a record, and you can uh, create a record anywhere. Now, should I then uh, uh, terminate the other two? Well, no, I'm not just terminate them yet. You might be able to use them as a special deposit someplace. Oh, okay. Um, you got a lien created from that method, you know, under debtor-creditor. You All you need to do is maybe switch it into a trust and then use that asset as a trust deposit. Oh, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> um, second part, second question is, 
A lot of people are doing the A4Vs to the three IRS offices and having success. What do you think about that uh, process? Well, uh, it's under the same thing. It's all under debtor creditor, and I think the, the success is still limited to under 10% because it's still for the discretion of the, the trustee for, uh-huh. say, Geithner. Okay, so they can shut that off any time, basically. Discretion. Okay. Now, uh, I've been foreclosed on, and Freddie Mac bought the property back, and the only thing that saved me was my lease with my renter, uh, so they gave me 90 days, which is up January 18th. Well, what can I, I mean, there's some things, i got plan A, B, C, but I don't know what the proper way to go. Now, MERS is, was the beneficiary, and I know they've lost in Kansas and Nevada, and uh, they, you know, were not a party of interest and or a holder in due course. Uh, will that help me in going, taking this to a federal court, or is that the proper venue? Yeah, what was the verdict on the first case? Why did you basically lose they were not a party of interest, is what Kansas said, and they they had no risk in the transaction. Uh, you know, they basically were nobodies in the transaction, so uh, they lost. And I think some other place they lost. Uh, they all grouped like twenty one. Well, no, no, no. I'm talking about your case. Oh, you know, you say they're foreclosed on the house. You got three months to leave, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. What was the verdict on your case? Why, why did you lose there? What was the... Uh, well, they basically just foreclosed on me. I mean, this is a non-judicial state, so I never went to court. Okay. Just, uh, okay. Went through their process, and th- I was just learning this stuff, you know. You put together a case and come in at against them and sue that case and bring in some kind of counterclaim to all that and then put in with an injunction and get that thing to be stayed so that you can freeze it all up until your case is heard. In federal court? Uh, for federal or state, you could do it state. Okay. Was it state that came out? Oh, no, that was non-judicial. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, state, I come in state. Okay. Start with first. And uh, so will these MERS cases help me? Yes, because the MERS, Really, today, nobody should really lose their house if they know how to litigate the case because, really, effectively, mirrors has been knocked out. Landmark time has proved that. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're done. That, that affects over 60 million plus mortgages, and nobody that has any mirrors specifically in a foreclosure action involved. If mirrors is involved, uh, there's no reason why you should lose your house. Good. You should good, good, good. right. But then yeah, come back in and, you know, sue the case. Come back in with a counterclaim. Uh-huh. In case, put in a, uh, I put in a, uh, an injunction and get that thing stayed. Get the case heard, reversed around. Okay. All right. Uh, the other Maybe thing, we're, stuff. Uh-huh. The other thing was uh, there was something about you know protecting tenants under the Foreclosure Act. Someone yes. had told me that even if uh, the ninety days are up that they can't really kick me out because uh, that, uh, they don't have possession of the place. And so they're going to, under color of title, but they're going to Yeah, they're going to come in and throw the tenants out with the legal process after 90 days. Yeah, there's nothing that can stop that part? Well, yes, there is, because, uh, you know, you, you could come in with this, this uh, legal action and jam it up. Okay. Yeah, after the 90 days, that frees up the time for when they can start coming at you with a, a what is it, detainer action and come at you with that. Uh, evict the tenants. What about it now? They have a right, if they have a valid lease, to take and complete the lease until the term of the lease is up. Well, it's so a five-year lease. Yeah, they've already approved the lease. Sorry. Okay, they can't throw the, the tenants out if they accept the, uh, uh, the well, they have to accept the lease, and, and you can stay there till the end of the lease. All you have to do is be keep making your payments. Really? Wow. Yeah, the lease, they make the payments on the lease. So how do I tell them that, that they have to honor the lease? Uh, that's federal law. 
if they, you know, to, to, uh, the, the tenants need to come and with them and show that they have a valid lease. And, and as long, I think the law says that as long as it's a fair lease with the value of the payments made in relation to everybody else around you, then they have to honor that lease until the lease runs out. Now, they the contract to. is with me and the renter. Uh, yes. The, now, the contract passes to the bank, and they must honor that contract according to federal law. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, so you need to go get the law. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here real quick. Uh, I have it, but I didn't know how to decide that part. Yeah, yeah, I have that title, whatever it was. Uh, yeah. But I, that part I wasn't very clear on, and somebody kind of told me that, but I, I just couldn't figure it out that... Uh, you know, that they have to honor the lease. But now, my renter, the contract is with me, uh, but they would have to make the payments to them? To them, right. I mean, the lease is now technically theirs, the banks. Because uh, they're one of the... So as long as they make the payments, then we can stay here for five years. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, great. for the length of the lease, and I think it runs for, you got to be a, like, uh, well, unless you've got a special lease that you've got, like, non-real estate lease, which would be, it uh, was could have made it up for three years. It was a non-real estate lease. Okay. Somebody very okay. knowledgeable had given me that, so. All right. Well, yeah, they got to honor the lease. Ha. All right. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Okay. Another question? Okay, uh, we have a follow-up on that uh, lady that had the trust question, uh, Kristen, and it was, uh, what, time, well, what or when are the uh, other calls, or she wants to know when she can uh, participate in your... Oh, the other calls? Ambassadorships, yeah, the other Skype uh, question, that last Skype question we had. Oh, okay. Well, the ambassadorship uh, calls, we haven't set any, any of those up yet, but, you know, if anybody wants to become an ambassador, you know, then send me an email at hush, let's see, um, excuse me, moving titles at hotmail.com. Okay. And I uh, want to mention that at the bottom of the hour, we are going to uh, a Forbidden History series and the premier edition of Starfire Chronicles. Uh, so we may not be able to answer everyone's questions, but we'll do the best we can. If we can keep it short and quick, maybe we can uh, help more people out that way. We'll go to uh, J.C. in Arizona. J.C., go ahead. Good to have you. Hey, Desert. Hey, Christian. Hey. Hold on just a minute. Let me, let me announce here the, uh, the other calls. Uh, on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm on another call. It's uh, the the Eric code for that call is seven two four 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 seven four four four. That's a talk shoot call, and the pin number to get in on that call is four one eight seven five pound. Uh, the number again is seven two four 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 seven four four four. Pin number is four one eight seven five. That's on uh, Wednesdays at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, then we have the, the Saturday show, and then we also have a Tuesday night call at 10 p.m. Eastern, and that number is, let me see, 605-715-4949, and the PIN number is 668 or let's see, what is the number on that again? Pin number 668-464. So that is, again, the number 605-715-4949. Pin number 668-464-POUND. And that's the Tuesday night call at 10 p.m. Eastern. So, okay. Go ahead. Okay, great. Desert, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh -huh. Hey, Desiree, Chris, and JC and RIT. So my question is, if you've already sent a, a promissory note or payment in fact to, um, uh, to another party and they've received it, are you stopped from claiming the trust if you didn't do that at the time or before you sent that payment? 
you know, the trust is still there. The trust was formed. Your signature formed the trust. You just never expressed it. Just come in and start expressing it and start creating the evidence that you got a trust and what you did with the trust deposit funds. Fantastic. So, so if the CFO, for example, of the IRS received the payment, but she didn't know what to do with that, she assumed it was debt or creditor, uh, I can do a follow-up registered mail with her and tell her that, oh, by the way, this was a, uh, intended to be a special trust deposit. I, I know this would never happen, but I mean, is it, it's theoretically possible for them to come back and say, oh, yeah, we already converted that. We didn't know that you, that was a special trust deposit, but we offset your books, and, uh, but we're not going to return any of the funds. Of course, that's fine. I'm happy with that. But I'm assuming that uh, they, if they do something with that before I put them on notice, again, would that, wouldn't you be a stop from claiming that that was a special tr trust deposit and they have a defense at least to a breach of, uh, breach of fiduciary? No, I don't think so, because I could claim it all back when they, uh, from the time that they got it, see. So even now they're holding it, they got it, okay? The only thing you're lacking right there is you need to do a, an assignment on UCC3 after you claimed it on a 1. Now, I can claim the assignment, even though they actually technically received delivery prior to the assignment. But once I officially sign it to them, now I can prove that they technically got it, and it, it's not pro tuck back to when the delivery occurred. So now I'm, I'm setting up a record of assignment, which is at that time effective for the delivery. And delivery is one method of formation, and also assignment is one method of, of uh, formation. And also when the, if he sent it by certified mail the first time, uh, an endorsement on the green card is also, because endorsement is signature. So signature on a green card could be evidence of a method of formation of a trust. But when I did the assignment now, I could do the assignment, say, three months afterwards, but yet claim it when it was first delivered or endorsed. See, see what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah, I do. But make sure okay, you do it first. Claim it. Right. Right. Okay, thank you.